All right, so for question number one, okay, the four components of climate are temperature, precipitation, light, and winds. Okay, what is the most important factor affecting climate for any location on Earth? Latitude. Okay, what factors affecting climate would make Victoria's climate most different from Calgary's? Proximity to the ocean would be one. And because it's right beside the ocean, it would have a very low altitude. Okay. Right? It's closer to the ocean, so that's one thing that makes it different, and it's about 1,100 meters lower okay, than we are. Number four, what part of the Earth is most responsible for distributing solar energy? The atmosphere. Okay, number five, what process is most responsible for transferring solar energy from one place to another? Convection, yeah. I would probably also accept wind, although convection would be more specific in a case like that. Okay, and number six, what process transfers energy by waves? Radiation. Okay, and within the lithosphere, which is solid, okay, what is what process transfers energy? Conduction. Okay, so we had one question here that was out of four. So we got four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, eleven marks. Okay, so it's out of eleven. Give them a mark out of eleven at the top of the page. Make sure your name is on that and pass it in, please. Okay, so we're going over today's specific heat capacity. It's a very simple concept. Okay. There is a, a formula that goes along with it, but it's super easy to manipulate and solve problems related to. All right. um, the main reason we go over specific heat capacity is because it's part of one of the factors that affects climate, okay. and that is proximity to the ocean. When you are close to the ocean, you are near a huge body of water, and water has a very high specific heat capacity. What that means is it takes large amounts of energy to heat water, that is to change its temperature. It also means that if water cools, it loses large amounts of energy, okay? And that's what keeps the climate of places that are near an ocean kind of regulated, right? As the air over the ocean cools, there is a lot of energy stored in the ocean. And the ocean can lose energy to the air, but its temperature doesn't change very much. Okay, because it has such a high specific heat capacity, right? So yes, if I add tons and tons of heat, water will heat up, but not as quickly as other materials, okay? Like for example, if I have a, a pot of water on the stove, okay, the water heats up slowly, but the pot, does, the, the pot gets hot really quick, okay? The pot has a very low specific heat capacity. That means very little energy causes a large change in temperature. Okay? For water, a large input of energy causes a small change in temperature, but it still put that energy in there. Right? So water can really regulate temperature and climate because it can release large amounts of energy without heating or cooling very much. Okay, So a couple of definitions. Heat capacity, okay, is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of an object by one degree Celsius. Okay, so heat capacity is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of an object by one degree Celsius. And we say object because that object may be made of more than one material. Okay, so that applies only to objects that are made of a mixture of several substances. Okay, if I'm talking about a pure substance, then I would be talking about specific heat capacity. This is a physical property, 
If we think back to unit one, okay, we talked about some other physical properties, solubility, okay, uh, whether they conduct uh, electricity in solution, pH, all of that kind of stuff. Okay, specific heat capacity is another one of the physical properties. It is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of a specific substance by one degree Celsius. Okay, so are we seeing the difference here? Heat capacity is very general. It's the entire object by one degree. Specific heat capacity deals with a specific substance, one gram of it, one degree Celsius. Austin. Uh, no. no, the energy will be in joules, yes. Okay, the specific heat capacity, the units for it are joules per gram degree Celsius. The amount of energy required to heat one gram by one degree. Okay, so the units for specific heat capacity are joules per gram degree Celsius. Oh. <clears throat> Looks like I'm getting a cold for Christmas. That's nice. All right, so the formula here, guys, that we would have to use for calculating things to do with specific heat capacity is E equals MC delta T, all right, where E is the energy, M is the mass in grams. This is a chemistry thing, okay, so we're back to grams for this, okay. C is the specific heat capacity, okay, C stands for capacity, all right, and delta T is the change in temperature, so essentially final temperature minus initial temperature. Okay, same as delta has been for absolutely everything else in this course. All right, now um, C, okay, the specific heat capacity, you'll either be asked to calculate what that is or you'll be told what the material is. And in your notes package, there is a chart of specific heat capacity. At least I think I put one in there. Apparently I did not. So I will have to make you one. Okay, actually, no, it's in your workbook. That's where it is. The digital workbook that I put on there, that's where it is. Okay, so there's a list of materials and their specific heat capacities. Okay, for, ex for a couple of examples, water has a specific heat capacity of 4.2 joules per gram degree Celsius. So to heat one gram, which is one milliliter of water, okay, that, that would be the volume, uh, the, that volume of water would look like about the size of a raisin. Okay, that would be one milliliter of water. By one degree Celsius requires 4.2 joules of energy. That's more energy than your cart had when you put it on the top of the ramp in the energy conversion lab. Okay, when we did that energy conversion lab, we found that that cart only had less than a joule of energy at that point. Okay, to heat one gram of water, a tiny little bit, by one degree Celsius, requires about six to eight times more energy than that cart had at the top of the ramp. Okay, it's a lot, okay? Heat energy, or sorry, water can absorb a lot of energy without changing its temperature, okay? Conversely, something like, um, let's say, I'm trying to remember here, it's, I think it's iron, is like 0.13 joules per gram degree Celsius, okay? So does iron heat up really fast? It does. It doesn't have you don't have to put much energy into it, and it's going to heat up really quickly, All right? Um, so, if you are let's say outside and you know you you touch the side of your car, okay, and it's really really cold outside, okay, does it feel really cold on your hands? For how long? Just a few seconds, because very quickly the heat transfers from your hands to the car, okay, and the car warms up, okay, at least that part of it warms up. Okay, it doesn't take long to heat stuff up. It'd be the same if you picked up like a coin off the off the ground. Okay, when it's really, really cold outside, you pick that coin up, the coin feels really cold. You put it in your hand in about five seconds, it's the same temperature as your hand. Okay, they heat up really quickly because they have low specific heat capacities. Right? Whereas if you take a bunch of water in your hand and it's around, you know, one degree Celsius or so, that's going to stay cold and it's going to make your hands really cold and you're going to have a hard time keeping your hands in or ha ha keeping that water in your hands. Right, like if you dunk your hands in like ice cold water, it's hard to hold them there. Incidentally, that's like the, like a manhood test. You can who can hold their hand in the ice water the longest. It's one of the I don't know. We used to do dumb things when I was young. Okay. All right. So is everyone following this formula here? Okay. In this formula, in the initial setup, everything is being multiplied together. So if I want to solve for anything other than e, what do I have to do with the other stuff? Divide it over to the other side. Is that pretty easy? 
Okay, the only thing that people screw up when they're manipulating this formula is bracketing. So let's say I'm looking for what the mass is. Okay, I would have E divided by C times delta T. That's got to be bracketed so that you get the bottom number, okay, top number divided by the bottom number, right? Otherwise, your calculator does order of operations, which does not give you the same answer. Usually, that's just something we do before, right? I just calculate what the change is and throw it in there, right? Because most questions don't give you final and initial. They just say the temperature changed by this much, okay? Very rarely does a question say, find the final temperature of the material. Not, I mean, it's an extra step, but it's not a difficult step. Find delta and then add it to the initial, or find delta and subtract it from the final. Okay? I mean, it's, it's not a, a super difficult calculation. Okay, so where we're going with this, guys, with this specific heat capacity stuff, is if I have, let's say, just um, a block of ice, and I start heating it up, what will happen to the block of ice? Before it melts... Right. I got to heat it up to zero. Ice won't melt until it gets to zero. So if I have a block of ice I take out of my freezer, it'd be about minus 15 or 16 degrees Celsius. Okay. So I heat it up and it will start to melt when it gets to zero degrees Celsius. But the weird thing is, is that while it's melting, its temperature stays at zero degrees Celsius. And so does the water that it's sitting in. As it melts, you have both water and ice coexisting at zero degrees Celsius. Okay. Once all the ice has melted, then the temperature will start to go up okay. until I reach what temperature? 100 degrees. And then it stays at 100 degrees until all the water turns to steam. Okay. And then if I keep adding heat, the steam will get hotter. And if I keep adding heat to that, eventually it becomes plasma, but that's beyond anything that we're going to talk about. That's You've essentially destroyed the molecular structure of it by then. Okay, So essentially what that gives us is what we call the heating curve of water. Anytime the temperature is changing, the kinetic thermal energy of the object is changing. Okay, Kinetic thermal en energy is measured by temperature. Okay, So anywhere where the line is going up, there's a delta T. So I could calculate how much energy is being used in these sections here using the formula we just talked about. Because the temperature is changing. In the sections where the graph is flat, I'm still adding energy in those sections, am I not? But if I try and use that formula, it's going to tell me how much energy is involved. And that's not right, is it? Okay, so at these places, the potential thermal energy of the material is changing. Okay, because when water goes, or any material goes from a solid to a liquid, what's happening to its particles? They're spreading apart, right? Because in a solid, they're packed, okay, and in a liquid, they're further apart. Actually, in water, that's not the case. In water, they're actually further apart than they are when they're in a liquid, but they're in a crystal matrix, so they can't move. Okay, water is one of those weird ones, right? It expands when it when it freezes. Okay, um, so that's what we have there. So during these two sections where I'm changing the potential thermal energy, I have to use a different formula, which we'll talk about later. Okay, but the reason we're going over specific heat capacity is so we know how to calculate how much energy would be involved in these three parts of heating up a material. Good question. No, it doesn't. Okay, water does not have the same heat capacity as a liquid as a gas, as a solid. It's actually different. One of the few materials that does that. Polar molecules are like that, okay? Um, so for ice, the specific heat capacity is 2.116 joules per gram degree Celsius. For liquid water, 4.2 joules per gram degree Celsius, okay? And for uh, steam, 2.02 joules per gram degree Celsius, All right? So actually different for each um, state. Does it make sense? Dens yeah, density doesn't have any actually anything to do with specific heat capacity, right? Because metals, metals are quite dense, but they have low heat. Well, some metals are quite dense, like aluminum isn't, but it has a low heat capacity. So, yeah. And actually, something with a very high heat capacity is hydrogen gas. Hydrogen gas is like 15 joules per gram degree Celsius. It's got an incredibly high 
specific heat capacity, but obviously it's a gas, it's not very dense at all. So. All right, so does that idea there make sense to everybody? All right, so what we're going to do is just go through a couple of examples of manipulating and problem solving to do with this formula, which is super easy. Okay, And if we're good at that, we may move on to looking at these two parts of the heating curve of water, Okay, because that's what we'll be doing when we come back from the break. Okay. All right, so let's try this one. How much heat or thermal energy okay, is needed to raise the temperature of 150 grams of water whose specific heat capacity is 4.2 joules per gram degree Celsius from 5 degrees Celsius to 85 degrees Celsius? All right, what am I given in this question? Okay, initial temperature and final temperature. Can I go and straight to delta now? What's the temperature change? 80. Okay. That, that means sometimes you can just do that step in your head, right, and save yourself some work. All right, what else am I given? Mass. What else? The heat capacity, okay? And either I'm given the number or I'm told the material. In this case, both. If I'm only told the material, then I look at my chart and I figure out what it is from there, okay? So C for this question is 4.2 joules per gram degree Celsius. All right. That means I'm using this formula, E equals MC delta T. Do I have to manipulate? Not for this one. All right, so I just plug in 150 grams times 4.2 joules per gram degree Celsius times 80 degrees Celsius. All right, 50,000. 400 joules. Is that a lot? Yeah, exactly. Okay, it's a lot of heat. Okay, it takes a lot of energy to heat up water. Anybody got a hot tub at home? Okay, think about how much energy is required to heat that hot tub now, especially when it's cold outside. Okay, and it's losing energy all the time to the surroundings. Okay, you're using a lot of energy to keep that hot tub going okay, and keeping its temperature up where you want it to be at. All right, because this is only 150 grams of water. That's 150 milliliters. It's, yeah, it's the size. Actually, it's less. A juice box, I think, is 175, isn't it? Yeah, or 200, right? This is less than that. Okay? Imagine how much is in a hot tub, okay? especially a big one. It's a lot, a lot of energy. Okay. As with all formulas, when I give you a new formula, I go through every manipulation with you. So that's what we're going to do here. Okay. What material is a 100-gram cup made of if it takes 4,200 joules of energy to raise the temperature from 12 to 62 degrees Celsius. What am I looking for here? I'm looking for the specific heat capacity, and then I'll have to compare it to the chart. Okay. So my givens in this are mass, 100 grams, okay, energy, 4,200 joules, temperature change, 50 degrees Celsius. All right, so E equals MC delta T, I'm looking for C. So divide both sides by M delta T. So C is going to equal 4,200 joules divided by 100 times 50. All right, 0.84. So now I got to look up what that is. So looking at my list here, which is on page whoop, 30, it looks like. Okay. 
it's glass. Okay, glass has a specific heat capacity of 0 0.840. Okay, and that's what we calculated here. Okay, when we did this, we got a specific heat capacity of 0.84 as well. So the material is glass. 0.84 joules per gram degree Celsius equals glass. Okay, everybody all right with that one? Awesome. No, that's specific heat capacity. Glass is a pure substance. Okay. On your test, it'll be on the front, or I'll put them in the question. Uh, that, that's the sheet you're going to get is in the worksheet package there. Okay, so you'll have to refer back to that back and forth. Okay. All right. So this, this would be as involved as a specific heat capacity question would get. What is the final temperature of a 185-gram block of iron initially at 7 degrees Celsius if it is heated with 200 joules of energy. All right, what am I going to have to find first? Okay, I can look that up. Yeah, 0.13, yeah. Lead and iron, no, iron is 0.460. Okay, so iron's 0.460. Okay, so C is 0 0.460 joules per gram degree Celsius. Okay, I'm also told the initial temperature, 7 degrees Celsius. Okay, I'm told the mass is 185 grams and the energy is 200 joules. Okay, what do I need to find if I want to find the final temperature? Okay. I have C, M, and E. What part of E equals MC delta T do I not have? Delta T, right. I have C, M, and E. So I'm going to find delta T. If I know how much the temperature changes by, and I know what the initial temperature was, can I use those to find the final? Yeah, I just add them together, right? Okay, temperature's going up. If I take the initial and add the change, that'll give me the final. All right, so the first thing I want to do then is find delta T, because it's the only part of this formula that I don't know. So we'll manipulate, that'll be E over MC equals delta T. 200 joules divided by 185 times 0 0.460. All right, so 2.35 degrees Celsius is the change in temperature. All right, so my final temperature then, okay, I mean if, sorry, we'll do this. Delta always equals final minus initial, right? So delta T equals final temperature minus initial temperature. So if I want to get final temperature by itself, what do I do with initial? Add it over to the other side. So I've got delta T plus initial T equals final T. So that'll be 7 plus 2.35 equals 9.35 degrees Celsius. That's as involved as they get. Okay, everybody all right with those? Okay, on that same page that we were just looking at, there are a few heat capacity problems. I want you guys to try a few of those right now. Okay, um, they they start out all asking for the same thing, so they go by section. So like the first five questions all ask you to find C, and then the next ones ask you to find energy and whatever. So you might just want to pick a few at random, like do one, do seven, do, you know, just so you get one kind of from each section, okay? We'll see how we're doing on those, and if we're doing well, then we'll move on to latent heat right away. Okay, so I'll give you a few minutes on those, and we'll go through any that give you trouble. All right, so let's continue on here, guys, and we're going to talk about the heating curve of water which we've already looked at briefly, okay? But we're gonna talk about latent heat, okay? Now, when we talked about latent heat the other day, we said that latent heat is this energy that is stored in water vapor when it moves from one place to another. So the energy it requires to evaporate water from like the surface of a lake or from the ocean or whatever, okay, is stored in the vapor and then the vapor gets transported by winds or by the jet stream or whatever to a new place when it condenses, the energy that it had stored is released as sensible heat instead of latent heat, okay, and that area then warms up. And we are talking about a lot of energy because to evaporate, 
one gram of water at 100 degrees Celsius requires 2,260 joules of energy. Is that a lot? Yes, it is a lot of energy. Okay, This is why when you get out of the shower in the morning, you feel chilled. Because every gram of water that evaporates from your body is going to take that much energy from your body to do it. Is that going to cool you off in a hurry? Yes. Okay, That's why sweating works. Okay, Sweating is awesome provided you have enough water to support the sweating. Okay, in the desert, sweating will cool you until you dry up like a prune. Okay, which can happen pretty quickly if you're losing lots and lots of water. Okay, now does that mean though that if you sweat a lot, like you're one of those like prolific sweaters? Okay, like I, I used to play basketball with a guy in high school who could not wear his uniform under his warm up during warm up because it would be soaked by the end of warm up. He was just one of those guys who had this slimy you know, kind of exterior. He, if he looked at the sun, he started to sweat. And if he like ran two feet, he just was pouring with sweat. Okay. Some people are like that. Does that mean that they cool themselves any better? No. And in fact, excessively sweating doesn't cool you better. It's best to have just a, a light kind of sheen of sweat on your body. Okay. Like a perspiration kind of, okay. That actually cools you better than having big giant droplets with low surface area to volume ratio. Okay. Having a large surface area to volume ratio, that kind of nice sheen of sweat, okay, is actually more effective at cooling you off. All right. Uh, so some people sweat excessively. That doesn't mean they cool themselves better. Okay. Um, Back, you know, five six years ago, when the Oilers really sucked, they had a goalie. Uh, they had a goalie named Nikolai Habibulin. Okay, and this guy would lose ten pounds in a game. Okay, because he would sweat that much. All right, he had every every time there was a stoppage in play, he would come back over to the bench and get a new blocker and a new mitt. Okay, because they would be dripping. Okay, with sweat and. He had holes drilled in the bottom of his skates so that the sweat could drip out of his skates. They actually caught it on the crease cam once. Okay? He was standing in net, and the crease cam was on his, on his skates, and you could see drops of water coming out of the bottom of his skates. Okay? This guy just sweat. like That's why the Oilers were no good in a shootout, because by the time they got to the shootout, he was so dehydrated and cramped up that he couldn't stop anything. No, I mean, there were other reasons the others weren't any good at that time, but now they are. So, <laughs> okay, now we can, now I can like wear my jersey, dust it off, okay, dust it off and wear it again, okay. Well, no, I, I'm, I'm a true Oiler fan. I just said once they drafted Nail Yakupov, I was not wearing my jersey until they got rid of that bomb. They got rid of him. Now I can wear my jersey again. Okay. Um, so anyway, the, the amount of energy needed to evaporate one gram of water is 2,260 joules. Okay. Now. You can see that on the heating curve, that's the biggest part of the graph, okay, is the evaporation part, because it requires the most energy. Down here, though, there's still some energy required to melt ice, okay? Uh, the latent heat of fusion, that's the amount of energy required to melt one gram of ice at zero degrees Celsius, is 333 joules per gram degree Celsius, okay? How many of you have made a snowball with your bare hands before? Okay, make your hands cold in a hurry. Every gram of that snow that melts in your hands takes 333 joules of energy from your fingers in order for that to happen. You know, your hands get cold very rapidly because heat is going from them into the snow and melting it. Oh, lots. Yeah, yeah, we're talking lots of energy. Okay, um, I mean a joule is an incredible is a small amount of energy. Okay, like if you ate let's say like a peanut, okay? A peanut, a single peanut, as long as you're not allergic to it, okay? Um, <laughs> would have probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 joules, 12 joules of energy, right? It's a high energy food, lots of fats and proteins and stuff. Okay, everyone following me here? So if let's say I have a block of ice at minus 25, and I wanna turn it into steam at 125 degrees Celsius, how many steps are there in doing that? Five. I have to heat the ice to zero degrees Celsius. Then I have to melt the ice. Then I have to heat the water to 100, evaporate the water, and heat the steam. Five different steps. 
and there's a formula for each step. You don't have to manipulate them, you just have to plug the numbers in. All I need to know is how much water, or ice in this case, am I starting with. Okay. All right, so if I'm melting or freezing something, okay, the latent heat of fusion value is 333 joules per gram. So to melt ice, 333 joules for every gram. When water freezes back into ice, it releases 333 joules of energy for every gram of water that freezes into ice. Everyone follow me there? Yeah, that's why you see steam rising off like a body of water that's getting cold and starting to freeze. A lot of energy gets released during that freezing process. All right. A fog, yeah. Okay, and I mean the bow. When you go over the bow, it's a little bit different because there is a warm water discharge into the bow from the sewage plant, okay, and things like that. So that's why the bow very rarely freezes all the way across. Like the sheep will freeze all the way across, in most places, except downstream of Okotoks where there's warm water discharge from the sewage plant. Okay, usually kind of right there when you go over 32nd Street. Okay, you guys know what I'm talking about? Okay, when you go over 32nd Street there, there's just a little kind of side channel that comes in right there, and it's never frozen. Okay, that's where the warm water discharge comes out. Okay, and so there's always a little bit of warm water coming in right there. Okay, um, so to figure out, to figure out how much energy is required to melt a certain amount of ice, you use this formula. E equals M times LF. LF is the latent heat of fusion, 333 joules per gram. Okay, if it takes 333 joules for every gram, logically I should multiply that number by how many grams I have, and that will tell me the energy involved. Agreed? Okay, if I have 10 grams, it's going to take 10 times 333 in order to uh, melt that ice. All right, is that a pretty easy formula to use? Okay. Same thing goes for evaporating or condensing. Okay, remember, we said that energy gets released when a whole bunch of water vapor condenses back into a liquid. Okay, For every gram, it's 2,260 joules. So imagine you've got a big mass of warm, moist air coming up from the equator that contains all this water vapor. Okay, Is there going to be a lot of water in there? Yeah. I mean, think about how much water would fall in a typical thunderstorm. Okay, If we get even a centimeter of rain covering an area the size of Okotoks. Is that a large volume of water? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't seem like much. It dries up in a hurry and runs off into the gutters and whatever, but it's a lot of water. You think about how much energy was released when that water condensed back into a liquid from a vapor. Okay, For every gram, it was this much energy. So it adds up to a lot. Okay? All right, so in order to calculate the amount of energy needed or given off, okay, it's E equals M times LV. Okay, so now instead of 333, it's 2,260. Okay, you will never have to manipulate that formula. You will only ever have to plug numbers into it. Okay, the numbers you plug in are always either 2,260 or 333, and whatever the mass is, and you'll always be given the mass. All right, so the kind of question we might encounter would work like this. Okay, so write this one down. We're going to go through this one. This is as big as they would ever get. I have 250 grams of ice at minus 15 degrees. I want to turn it into steam at 150. So the first thing I do is I draw my heating curve of water. Okay, This is just a shape that you have to remember. Right, it's not going to be given to you on your formula sheet. I'll give you the 2,260 and the 333 and all the heat capacities and all that. But this shape you have to remember. And then what I want to do is mark my start and end point on the graph. So I'm starting at minus 15 degrees. That's about there, right? Because this flat line here is at zero. And this flat line here is at 100. Everybody all right with that? So I'm going to steam at 150 degrees, so basically right at the top of this graph. Anywhere the graph changes direction is the end of one step and the start of another. Okay, so this is going to be step one. This will be step two, three, four, 
and 5. All right, do I have a formula that tells me how much energy is required to change the temperature of some material? What is it? Right, specific heat capacity formula. All right, where, which steps on this graph am I going to use that formula for? The diagonal ones, right, which numbers? One, three, and five. All right, so on step one, I'm going to use E equals MC delta T. Okay, in step two, the temperature doesn't change. So I'm obviously not using E equals MC delta T there because it'll tell me no energy was required. And that's actually correct. There's no kinetic thermal energy being required in that step because what's the water doing? It's changing state, which is a change in potential thermal energy. All right, so to calculate potential thermal energy, that's when I use these two formulas. In this case, I use E equals MLF because I'm at the freezing point of water. All right, so this is where I use LF, which is 333. Everyone okay with that? Okay, what do I use in step three? E equals MC delta T, changing temperature. Okay, in step four, what am I using? MLV, right. In this case, I'm using E equals MLV because I'm talking about the vaporization of water. And then in step five, E equals MC delta T because I'm changing the temperature of the steam. Okay. Is delta T the same for steps one, three, and five? No. That's a very common mistake. Okay? I see a lot of people who use the same delta T in every step, and it's the whole change in temperature. Okay? Guys, the last time I checked, ice does not exist at 150 degrees. Okay? Last time I checked. Maybe things have changed since this morning, but okay, I doubt it. Right? Ice is only going to change temperature from minus, uh, what did we say, minus 15, I think? We, yeah, minus 15 degrees to zero. So for this step, delta T is only how many degrees? 15, all right? What specific heat capacity am I using for step one? The one for ice, all right? So that's gonna mean then 150 grams, right? You said it was 150? No, 250. Okay, 250 grams, the mass, times the specific heat of ice, 2.116, times 15 degrees Celsius. Oh, man. <coughs> No, it's, it's in a positive increase. It's going from minus 15 to zero. That's a positive increase. Okay? It, you can put negative numbers in if it was a cooling question, right? and then you're going to get negative numbers for your energy, which means energy being released. Right? This, we're saying energy input for this one. Okay. For step two, is it still 250 grams? Yes. doesn't matter whether it changes from ice to water. The mass is still the same. I have the same number of molecules of water, so the mass does not change. 250 times LF, which is 333. That's joules per gram. Okay, then in step three, okay, I'm still going to have 250 grams, but now I'm going to multiply by 4.2, the specific heat capacity of water. And what's my temperature change in step three? 100 degrees. I'm going from zero to 100. Okay, in step four, 250 times LV, which is 2,260 joules per gram. And then in step five, 250 times the specific heat of steam, 2.02, okay, times this, the change in temperature. I'm going from 100 to 150, so that's 50 degrees. All right, what do I have to do with all of those? add them all together. That will be the total energy required. On a test, I would probably not give you a five-step question. It takes too long. I would probably give you a three-step question. So like from ice at minus 25 to water at 80. Okay, That way you would have to go through 
uh, one potential energy change and two um, kinetic energy changes or vice versa, you know, something like that. All right, so when we're doing these calculations, okay, so we got 250 times 2.116 times uh, 15. All right, so that's our first step, 7,935 joules. Okay, then we got uh, 250 times 333, so 83,250 joules. Okay, what are you noticing about kinetic energy changes versus potential energy changes? Yeah, potential takes a lot more. To change the state of something takes a lot more energy than to change something's temperature. It's very easy to change kinetic thermal energy. All right, um, for step three, 250 times 4.2 times 100. Okay, so 105,000. Okay, that was a big temperature change though, right? So it makes sense that it should be a pretty big number. Okay, then we gotta change the uh, state from liquid to gas, 250 times 2,260. 565,000 joules. All right, and then our last one, heat up the steam to 150 degrees. 250 times 2.02 .02 times 50. 25,250. All right, so I add all those numbers together and I'll get my total. So plus 565,000 plus um, 105,000 plus 83,250 plus 7,935. Okay, 786,435 joules. Is that a lot? Yes. Okay, would take a lot of energy to accomplish that. Okay, questions on how that works? We'll work a little bit on that um, when we come back from the break. Okay, um, when you uh, go on a picnic, let's say, and you take a cooler with you, what do you put in the cooler? Why? Keep the food cold. Well, what couldn't couldn't I just put cold water in there? Yeah. Well, but the ice melts. So that whatever's in there's going to get soggy anyway. Well, if water takes longer to heat up, wouldn't I want to put water in there? But once I put that ice in there, it's essentially at zero degrees anyway, right? Ice isn't going to stay at minus 15 or 16 for very long. Can stay cold longer than water would? Guys, here's the whole thing. If I put ice in at zero degrees Celsius, this is where it starts. If I put water in at zero degrees Celsius, this is where it starts. Which one can absorb more heat from the food? Ice, right? It's got to change state before it can warm up. If I just throw water in there at zero, the water will just start to warm up. It can't absorb as much energy as the ice, which starts over here. Okay, that's the whole reason for putting ice in the cooler. Okay, it's not that the ice is colder. I could put water at zero degrees in there, but it won't absorb as much energy as the ice because the ice has to change state before it can warm up. Everybody follow on that? That's the kind of like application thing you might be asked to talk about, say on a test. Okay. Now let's uh, quickly guys talk about the climatogram thing here. <clears throat> 